Hi uh, everybody, um, my name is Stephen Bernard and I'm the Interactive Designer at uh, the Financial Times. Um, apologies for those of you who are expecting to see Alan Smith today, but um, he's company in the uh, training our colleagues in D3. Um, so today I wanted to talk to you about a project that I've worked on earlier in the year called Japan the Next Big Quake. Um, the aim of this project was to um, show what would happen if a magnitude 9 earthquake hit a heavily industrialised region of Japan and what the economic impact would be. Um, before I go through how the um, project was commissioned, developed and produced, I just want to um, show you what the final outcome looked like. So, um, so we started off with an introductory video, um, an animation basically setting the scene, allowing the reader to uh, get a sense of what was happening. So I'm just going to play this for you now. There's no sound, so don't worry about that. So that's basically to give the reader a sort of sense of what this article is going to be about. And it was essentially broken down into several chapters. Um, there's plenty of key facts, charts, data, um, and essentially maps as well, um, showing all the information. Now, normally with um, projects that have a lot of geographic data, the first question we get asked is, can we have an interactive map? Nice map by Google, loads of dots on it we can click on and get loads of information. Now, the unusual answer to this is no. Uh, but you could have something like this. And this is a project we did earlier in the year um, on ISIS oil. And it's a lot more effective in uh, conveying information. Um, the reason why we don't do so many interactive maps is because they're just a terrible experience on mobile, forcing the user to pinch and zoom and click on a myriad of icons which then brings up a pop-up window which covers half your map anyway, then you make them close and click on others. It's just not a very good experience. And um, it summed up very well earlier this year at a data visualisation conference. Um, Archie Che, who's a deputy graphics editor of the New York Times, basically said this, if you make the reader click or do anything other than scroll, something spectacular has to happen. If you make a talk tip or roll over, assume no one will ever see it. If content is important for readers to see, then don't hide it. So with this in mind, um, we agreed to take on the uh, project in the format of the ISSR, so essentially a long-form story of narrative interspersed with graphics and charts. Um, so the editor went away, spent a week or so um, deciding what he was going to write and how the structure of the story would be, and I started interrogating the data that we already had. Now we had uh, two data sets from the Japanese Meteorological Agency, one was the seismic intensity, which is like a degree of shaking. It's different to the Richter scale, but it's actually the um, sort of intensity of shaking. Um, and also the tsunami wave height along the coast in the area that was going to be affected. Now, the original data set was over 3.6 million rows, so it's a little bit unwieldy. You can't really do anything with it in um, Excel because that drops off at a million rows. Um, so, and the other um, major problem with it was we didn't know what the data was showing. All of these supporting information was in Japanese. Um, but luckily, the FT had just been bought by a Japanese company, and we had a Japanese journalist on hand in the newsroom to do some translation for us. And what we discovered was the data set was actually a 250-meter by 250-meter grid with the corresponding seismic intensity data attached to it. So once we knew what it was, um, I employed the uh, services of my talented colleague Martin Sharber, who's a wizard at uh, databases, 
and basically trim the base set down into a lot more manageable uh, size and put it into a format that I could use inside QGIS. Um, QGIS has got this great function called the polygon function, which basically allows you to feed it a set of coordinates and bring it into CSV and it will draw these polygons onto your map and retain any of the attributes in your spreadsheet. So in this case, we have the um, 250 meter squares with the size and intensity data mapped on. So then it's just a question of like, um, applying a simple color back to it. And we ended up with this, which was our sort of first visualization of the data. So the next challenge after doing this was how we're going to visualize the tsunami wave height along the coast. Um, we tried a couple of different ways of doing it. Um, one of the first ones we tried were proportionately scaled circles along the coast, so the bigger the wave, the bigger the circle. The problem with this is they start overlapping and the data gets hidden. Um, so again, we tried a color ramp, dark blue representing higher wave height, lighter green, lower wave height, but it didn't really have the sort of visual impact I was after. So this led me to come up with the idea of trying to do a 3D visualization of it um, using Blender, which is a 3D program, it's open source. So it's, um, anyone can use it, it doesn't cost an arm and a leg. Um, so in order to do that, I had to create a digital elevation model of the tsunami wave height. Um, digital elevation model, I probably don't need to explain it to anyone here, but I imagine they know what it is, but for those that don't, um, it's essentially a black and white image where normally black represents sea level and white in the image, the higher the elevation above sea level. Um, so I did this in QGIS, just, just a simple um, color ramp from black to white. Um, then I would take this into Blender. So in Blender, I create a plane, which is supposed to be just a 2D sheet, as it were, and subdivide it into thousands of um, pieces, which basically makes it into a sort of flexible mesh. And then when you apply this dev as a texture on top, you can displace the individual vertices on the plane based on how white the image is. So with a bit of lighting and a bit of color, um, came up with this visualization of the wave height along the coast, which got myself and my editor very excited and got me thinking about doing an uh, entire introductory animation like the one I showed you, um, showing what the impact would be of an earthquake in this region. So the first thing I had to do was go away and draw up a storyboard. Um, now I know this is not going to come up in my door anytime soon working on the next Pixar animation, but it helped give the um, editor a sense of what I was going to be showing. So once it's got the green light, it's a question of going into um, NASA and um, USGS Earth Explorer to get all the materials I would need to create a 3D model of this part of Japan inside Blender. So say the first point of call is the USGS Earth Explorer, which is a great website for downloading various different types of geographic data. Uh, but the ones I was interested in were the demo files, so I could um, stitch them together, get a nice detailed view of the region. And then I went to the Visible Earth section, Blue Marble for NASA, where they have the bathymetry, which is essentially the demo equivalent of a sea floor. Um, but in order to create this single landmass inside Blender, I needed to have these two combined together. Um, you can obviously see the glaring problem with this is that the black on the landmass is the sea and the white on the lap on the sea floor is the sea level, so they're both completely different. So I had to combine the two of them inside Photoshop, it's essentially making a 50% of the way being the sea floor, sea, sorry, the sea level on uh, both of the files. So that then enabled me to take this into Blender, do the same thing I did with the um, example showing the tsunami wave height, and distorting a plane based on the, the levels of the grays in the um, then file. So with adding colour and um, the uh, seismic intensity data, I came up with this visualisation. Um, I basically didn't like the look of it when it was just a flat plane in terms of it looks like a sheet of paper. So I extruded it to give it more like a sort of feel that it's a solid sort of slab of earth that we've cut out of the, uh, the earth and we're looking at that. So next step was basically, once I had all the data inside Blender, it was a question of creating a motion path for the camera and um, adding uh, all of the timings, transitions for all the data that I was going to show, the wave height, the seismic intensity, the location of all of the industrial plants in the region and the infrastructure. 
So rendering out this took quite a long time. Blender is, is great for doing the small visualization, but it's very small intensive on the hardware. We don't have supercomputers at EFT, so having to make do with our Mac desktops. Um, but luckily one of my colleagues was on holiday, so I hijacked his Mac for 30 hours and got a thousand frames that I needed to do the animation. So then I took the frames along the initial um, globe animation into um, After Effects, where the whole thing was stitched together, you know, adding the subtitles and the, the earthquake shake effect, um, which normally gets a laugh, but in this case, but fair enough. Um, so by the time I'd finished all of this um, animation, it had taken probably two to three weeks, uh, not solidly working on it. I had something pesky like the US primaries to work on at the same time, so I couldn't devote all of my time to it. Um, but this gave the, um, say the editor the time to finish his narrative and decide how the um, story was going to be broken down and he'd acquired various um, sets of data to support the various chapters in the story. So I looked through these and helped guide him in which ones best helped support the narrative that he was trying to show. So I'm just going to go back to the uh, website. So we started off showing the, um, the Mankai Trough, which is the, the culprit in this uh, scenario, which is going to cause all the problems. Basically, just to give the reader a sense of what um, area of Japan we're talking about and give them a sense of uh, what was going to happen. And following it with a, a timeline which emphasizes the fact that this is seriously overdue, history shows that there's been a major earthquake in this region every 100 to 150 years, and it's been now 162 years in counting. So it's not a question of if it will happen, it's more a question of when. And um, the government agency said there's like a 70% chance that this will happen in the next 30 years. So we need to prepare for it. Um, the next map was um, basically a still from the blender animation um, through more annotations to so get a sense of what the wave height is and emphasizing the fact that this will literally hit land in five minutes or less so you have literally no time to uh, get to safety. Um, this data is basically showing the death toll and the amount of buildings that would be affected by the, uh, the tremors. And the charts at the bottom show, just about to make that comparison, um, what the earthquake in 2011, the one that caused the damage to the Fukushima nuclear reactor, how it compares with um, the scenario that we're talking about today. Um, it's surprising me how, you know, how much more serious this new one is when they were both magnitude nine earthquakes. Um, the reason for this is that the one in 2011 happened out way out to sea. It took 25 minutes for the tsunami to hit land. It happened during daylight hours, so people had a chance to react, get to safety. And as the chart above shows, it's not a tsunami that causes damage to buildings, it's predominantly the shaking because it was out to sea. It didn't cause so much devastation on the land. Um, next one shows the, um, all the industrial um, plants and factories that are in the region and how close they are to the very intense shaking areas that would happen if this quake actually hit. Um, and about it from the chart. So yeah, there's some more basically showing about the um, how prevention can help um, save buildings and lives obviously. Um, currently the um, Japan has 79% of their buildings earthquake proof um, and obviously getting this up to 100 percent would drastically reduce the number of lives lost in buildings collapse by up to 85 percent and also the cost of rebuilding by as much as 50 percent so the estimate was 220 trillion yen if this earthquake here which is 40 percent of japan's entire gdp which is basically putting back into the dark ages for probably a couple of decades <coughs> so let's go back to um, so how do we get all of these maps and charts looking good on all devices? And we just touched on um, yesterday with the responsive design. That's essentially what we did for this. We didn't go with the SVG route because these weren't sort of, they are data-driven maps, but they weren't sort of traced in D3. Um, so we used um, at the FT AI to HTML, which is a fantastic um, script written by the guys at the New York Times, which they very kindly made open source. Um, and essentially what it does is it takes your Adobe Illustrator artboards and turns everything that isn't um, text into a PNG um, and then creates a layer over the top of um, absolutely positioned text, um, percentage um, properties relating to the edge of the artboard. So whatever viewport you're looking at on a mobile or a tablet or a desktop, the text is in the right place and even if you resize your browser, it's um, 
will look um, totally legible. The problem with doing PNGs and just having text on PNGs is that once the browser resizes, the text shrinks with it and it becomes illegible. Whereas with the text being HTML, it stays um, perfectly legible the whole time. So this is saved on the main kind map. So that's on a desktop, on a tablet, and on a map. And on a mobile. So it's still legible. You have to obviously allow for um, mobiles being particularly small. So we've got fairly complex maps. It's very difficult to um, get a lot of information in this. I mean, this was like the hardest challenge, obviously, the industrial one, because there's so much data on it. But just switching the uh, positioning of the uh, sort of magnifying glass, um, to moving it to a more portrait orientation, moving the legend and moving the locator and the scale around helps um, solve that problem. So the other thing that um, AI to HTML does is it adds classes to all your different articles. So using that in conjunction with um, something we've got called origami, which sounds very weird, but it's basically um, the FT's very own set of components, which um, are like the building blocks of the website. And there's one particular component called um, Overid. Everything's got O in front of it, O for origami. Um, and it's basically, everything's controlled with SAS. So using um, SAS mixings, you're allowed to, you're basically leveraging to look at the um, class and then assign the size and the visibility. So depending on what input you're on, it will choose the correct article to show and the size it needs to be shown at. So that was um, really, really useful. And like I say, it's open source, so anyone can use it. Um, when the, the article published, it was um, overwhelmingly successful on social media. It became our most popular FT video ever with over 900,000 page views on Facebook, which is uh, a nice uh, reward after sort of spending so much time doing the animation. And um, the surprising fact is that it was the number one search result for Japan Earthquake for about four or five days after it published. Um, also more surprising because there was only, there was only a um, the magnitude five of the Japan two weeks earlier, so for that to be up there was um, very satisfying. Um, even though I'd say this was a digital-led project, um, initially starts off with that, if not really an intention of getting in the paper because it was such a large story, um, we managed to convince um, a section of the paper called the big page, which is the, essentially the big page, so it's, it's like the biggest story in the page of paper for that day. Um, so when they saw what we'd done online, they really got ex excited and wanted to have it on print. Um, and it was my, my, say, my proudest moment in 20 years of being at the FT, getting my first ever byline. So it was, uh, it was very important seeing your work in print. There's something still very uh, rewarding about having something in print and seeing your name in it. And that's probably a bit uh, vain, but it's, uh, it's, it's very satisfying. So uh, yeah, that's it. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Steve. Well, love that. Um, I've got a few questions, but I'm going to throw it over to the floor first. Um, Emily? Thank you. Is it somewhere in front? Um, yeah, for the benefit of everyone else, I know we, we talked about this in yeah. the meetings earlier, but uh, have you got any advice for those of us who might provide press releases of graphics in press releases for how we can help? Um, uh, graphic editors at newspapers to yeah, uh, right. work with our work. Sure. Um, like I said, we were talking about it earlier at breakfast. Um, mm. It's one of those things where if you get in press releases, invariably the VFT is not something you just take and then bonk online exactly as it is without any um, adjustment to what it looks like. We always got our own house style. So press releases, if they're information graphics, we would literally take those uh, graphics and redraw them ourselves in our style. Um, so obviously that becomes a bit tricky when the press releases are just a JPEG of a chart or an infographic. Um, something being a PDF where it's vector based enables us to essentially take it and then just restart it. It's a lot faster than obviously having to redraw it. Um, and but if there are these sort of actual data based graphics, then essentially having the underlying data makes life so much easier. Whether it's an Excel spreadsheet or a JSON file, whatever, it looks like a web uh, version. Um, making the data available behind it makes our uh, life so much easier because it can turn a chart around in sort of 10 minutes as opposed to an hour busy tracing lines. It's not really a, something we enjoy doing, so uh, 
getting the data behind it is the uh, sort of key to making it more accessible for media organisations. You, I'm just going to ask one from Charlie in there. You uh, touched on the, your, your social success. Mm. Um, do you design specifically for different channels? Do you repurpose that design? Yeah. Uh, do you have formats? So there's quite a few brushes in there. Yeah, but... No, exactly. That's, um, that's something that we've actually been working on very hard for the past um, six months or so. Um, our in, uh, usual format was basically any chart that went online, we would, because um, we save them as PNG with transparent backgrounds, they go on the website. Um, people would just copy the images sometimes and tweet them out, and they just look black. Because obviously, transparency goes black on Twitter and Facebook. So, uh, we came up with a, a new style specifically for social. Um, the pink background looks kind of weak when you're flicking through a stream, and you've got sort of pale pink with sort of cloud lines. It looks very elegant on the web, but when you're trying to grab someone's attention on social media. Um, so, we come up with a lot more um, a punchier, it's basically a black and white style with very um, lurid of set up just five colours and um, beautiful beautifully